Ravana, the great king, the Shiva Bhasta, reduced to a hungering, lustful body capable of deceit, stood upon the world just what had she done? Kiss is a bomb. What does this society do for me that the fear of losing that will make me forget that I have been raped? And with feeling, gratitude even, I thought, here at last I can be me. Where it doesn't matter what I have or haven't between my legs. Where I will be seen for what I am, really what I am. I can be free, free to be me. Namaskar, we welcome you all to our interview series in pursuit of excellence, presented by Sangeet Vidya Niketan and Saha Pedia. Today we have amongst us renowned dancers and choreographer Padma Bhushan Srimati Malika Sarabhai. Namaskar, Malika Ji. Namaskar. So, Malika Ji, uh, like we were speaking um, uh, previously, you have been utilizing your classical arts training and vocabulary to address a lot of social, socially relevant and critical issues. So we're going to talk about that, but I wish to begin with understanding your training in classical arts because I think I read somewhere that you were not trained by your mother, the famous renowned dancer Mrilani Sarabhaiji. So if you could just take us through the early training phase and how you got introduced to Bharatanatyam and Kuchipuri. Well, got introduced, I suppose, by birth because I was born into not only a family, but physically a home where every single space was classes. So I think I must have toddled between the legs of various dancers, uh, dance students. Um, as I was growing up, our daily sort of schedule was arranged around when the dining room was empty of classes or when we could go on to the terrace to play and so on. So the introduction was, I think, uh, pretty hardwired. There was nothing I could do about it. Uh, I didn't want to dance. I was a lazy child and uh, I thought it was just too much hard work. From a very young age, from about three, I think three or four, I loved being on stage and I loved being the center of attention, but I didn't want to do any of the things that could get me there. So in the beginning, I remember one of my earliest memories is we used to have this fabulous amphitheater, not the one where I'm sitting, but when I was a child, the amphitheater used to be part of the original fort walls of the founder of Ahmedabad city, Ahmed Shah. And there was a circular wall on the level of the river Sabarmati and people would sit on the lawns and there were steep steps going down to it from our garden. And I remember a performance very clearly when it was somebody else's Arangetram. And I remember the pavade I was wearing and standing with a diya surrounded by mogra flowers and feeling very thrilled that I was part of this whole thing. I started dancing really because all my friends in school were in my mother's classes. And basically those three hours of the week, I had nobody to play with. So willy nilly, I joined. And the first two years were just sort of playing around and so on. And then I was first trained by Kittapa Pillai uh, of, the, of the Pandanalur Gharana. Uh, there used to be a thatch roofed Kerala outhouse in the garden. And I remember very clearly, uh, he was already fairly old, or certainly to my eight-year-old or seven-year-old eyes, he was old. And I remember learning from him and saying, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. It's too hard. I would much rather be sitting reading an Enid Blyton book. Uh, but so it wasn't till much later, much, much later, that I actually decided to dance. But willy-nilly, I was in a school well, welcome to Darpana and the peahens and the peacocks and the mongoose and, and the cats and my dogs. But that apart, uh, 
I was in a school where dance and music and theater were very important. And I must have had some talent because I was always being cast as Damianti to Nala and Portia and Radha to Krishna. So whether I liked it or not, I was constantly dancing. I learned Manipuri from Darshana Javeri, for instance. And uh, I remember one of the earliest things I learned was the Lavani at the age of five, um, not, not knowing at all what the connotation was. But by the time I was 14, I had finished the basic course. And Amma being Amma, she had researched into the Shilapadikaram and knew that the first time that a coming on stage and Arangetram was mentioned was when Madhavi, the court dancer, does it in the Shilapadikaram. And that's why Kovalam, the hero, falls in love with her. So my Arangetram was actually playing Madhavi in a production of the Shilapadikaram. By the time I was 15 and I had gone into college, I was thrown into every ta talent cabin, into every college evening and so on and so forth. And I remember very distinctly at the age of 16, uh, dancing in an intercollegiate competition. And by chance, Papa happened to be here and he drove down and he was very excited after seeing me on stage and he said, oh, you must dance, you must dance. And then a week later, I did extremely well in a physics test. And he said, oh, you must become a physicist. So, you know, this was the sort of background. And then the only two years when I was completely cut off from dance for the two years I was in the IIM. It was a couple of years after that, that I had gone through an intense depression. And uh, Papa had died. My mother had stopped being so interested in touring or dancing and we were pushing her into it. And I was in this sort of fairly nihilistic depression and woke up one morning saying, I want to dance. Luckily, I had been trained all the time. I did eight, nine hours or years of Bharatanatyam. Then Amma allowed me to learn Kuchipuri from my amazing Guru Siyara Acharyalu. But Amma actually didn't start working with any of us till we were committed to a professional career. She would come in and supervise classes, but we always learn from other people. So after Kittappa Pillai, I learned from Amma's partner, Chatuni Panikar, who was a guru with a serious temper. And we used to have the Tattakiri flying at us and questions like, are you a camel or a dancer? Regularly asked. <laughs> and uh, then many, many gurus after that. But Chatuni Bhai till I became a professional dancer. So Kittapa and then Chatuni Bhai and Master Ji, uh, as we called C.R. Acharyalu. And my polishing and training with Amma began formally only after I joined the professional company. But she was like, she was like my ideal of beauty, of transparency that makes for a dancer touch the rasika. Uh, she was everything that to me was the aesthetic ideal. So it was perhaps a bit like Ekalavya and Drona as well. That though she never actually taught me, she was always my ideal. Yeah. And uh, Nani Sarabhai Ji is renowned to take up social issues. And she was, I think, a pioneer in that sense by, you, you know, doing productions like Chandalika or Memory or Tashir Desh. But you also had your fair share of... Uh, feministic productions, which I think began with uh, Prita Pook Brooks Mahabharata. So I wish to ask you this, this sensibility of being an independent lady and taking up social, socially relevant issues. Was the seed sown? Because you worked for so long with Prita Brook and you delved into this epic Mahabharata, or was it because of your parents, Rani Sarabhai and Vikram Sarabhai, who were very liberal and forward in their approach? I want to understand. Well, I think both in many senses. First of all, having always been surrounded by Amma's work, it had not occurred to me that all dancers do not dance about their times. So it was a rude shock in some senses to think that Amma had actually forge a completely new path for Indian dance. And for, for dance in general, I think Gamma was one of the pioneers anywhere of coming from a very classical background and reflecting what was around her. So that was one. Madhur, before I went to the Mahabharata, I started professional dancing in 77 and I went away in 84 
when I had already become an extremely celebrated Bharatanatyam and Kuchipudi dancer, not in India, but across wherever I had danced. So there was this very heady feeling of being a soloist. And I had also done two very intense productions to start my career, both Meera and Chandalika with Amma, which forged an amazing partnership. But I had always thought of myself as clay for another creator. I did not think I had it in me to create. So the question of whether I wanted to create pieces that reflected social reality didn't come into my head because I didn't want to create. I didn't think I could create. When I went into the Mahabharata, it was five years of intense loneliness, of having no background, no nurturing family, nothing but having to defend my beliefs, defend my interpretation of Draupadi and therefore Shakti, and of being able to speak of this interpretation of mine to very different audiences, audiences who were skeptical, audiences who knew nothing of India, audiences who felt all Indian women were herding cows and suffering poverty, and who had no concept of Shakti. With Peter, I had to even argue my interpretation of Draupadi because in the early rehearsals, A, I was the only Indian, but B, I was also the only non-professional theater actress out of 22 people from 22 countries. So I was at a great disadvantage. Then I didn't speak French. So three huge disadvantages. But Peter would say to me, don't raise your voice. You sound like a shrew. And I would say, Peter, there are no shrews in India. There are shaktis but there are no shrews. And I would get into these arguments with him saying, you're an Anglo-Saxon male, what do you know? But what happened was that I, I saw the effect that Draupadi, as I was interpreting it in this multicultural production, had on diverse groups of women. Women who did not consider themselves feminist, women who were aboriginals, you know, who came from a completely different culture. Uh, young women of Indian origin in America who would come to me and say, why was this interpretation never given to us? Why were we only told of Sita as suffering and following her husband? This is the kind of Indian woman we relate to. And I came out thinking that, you know, I have fought for rights in my own small way, whether it was in school or in college or out on the streets. If somebody was beating up a woman, even as a child, I would halt the car and run out and, and argue and try and bring them apart. And I thought that really seeing the way Draupadi is being reacted to, if one character, one single character, can have this profound impact into the very questioning that women do of their womanhood, of whether they believe in equal playing grounds or not, on whether the race is with men or with the best of women. If I can bring all these questions to the fore through this one character, my activism has to take this greatest of languages, which is the arts. And I was fortunate in having training in vocal music, in puppetry, in theater. So, Though pre-Mahabharata, I had been primarily a classical dancer who had never done professional theater, who had done some professional puppetry, but not as an adult. When I went into saying I have to create my own pieces, I did not see myself as a dancer. I saw a palette of languages that were available to me. And that what I wanted to say and whom I wanted to say to would dictate which of these languages I would use, whether languages that existed or whether I needed to forge new languages or whether I needed to learn new languages. So in my first piece, Shakti, the Power of Women, which looks at how language marginalizes women. Simple example, Bal and Abala. The minute you say abala for a woman, you are demeaning her through the definition of a language. All the little things have an E sound and all the big things 
have an R sound. So male and female, very definitively. So I wanted to take this definition that limits women, either historically or mythologically, or today in the way we describe a news event, for instance, or in the way a textbook describes a current event. And I wanted to see how I could do this by taking some characters from mythology, some from the medieval period, and some from then, which was 1990, 91. And one of the medieval characters I chose was Rani Lakshmi Bai. And I felt that she demanded martial arts. So I went and I learned from Satyan, who is today one of the greatest Kalari masters. He was a young man then. We are talking 30 years. Uh, and he came and he lived with me in Darpana. And we evolved a style where Kalari could be used as a performance style. And I used the famous poem, Khub Ladi Mardani Wo To Rani Wali Jhansi Thi, as the text, but in different ways, as sung text, as um, recited text, while doing Kalari. So I learned, even in my first piece, I had to learn how to do something. And that has really been my motto. I don't decide that I know Bharatanatyam, therefore I will do Bharatanatyam for this. Uh, in all the work I have done, I have first had to feel impassioned about something. I then have to figure out who is the audience for that piece. And then had to figure out what is the best way of saying it. What is the best... Uh, what is the best way of creating the rasa I want to create? Yeah, and uh, Rinan, uh, when Rinani ji saw your productions, did she play any part? Did she give inputs? And since you said that you did not feel very comfortable in assuming that you can create, so, but when you finally started creating your production, Shakti or Sita's Daughters, you know, and, and the later one, what role did your mother play in it? I want to know. Oh, she was thrilled and she used to say, you see how lucky you are to have a mother like me because I trained you in everything. I let you do whatever you want. So you have so many languages. I only have dance and writing. I can't sing. I could act, but I don't have the confidence. So you see what a lucky person you are to have a mother like me. And she was very supportive. Yeah. And she was incredibly supportive, very excited. And uh, talking about... Uh, Taking up these socially relevant and critical, and actually not just social, you've also worked with a lot of environmental issues, religious issues, you know, basically critical issues, which do make a difference in the society that we live in. Uh, now, Malika ji, I want to ask you, when you take up these contemporary, not themes, but issues, actually, you know, which need ad addressing, and you have mentioned that you also incorporate different styles and different uh, vocabularies, I want to understand how difficult or easy is it for you to utilize the classical vocabulary which you have learned for these contemporary themes? Because, uh, yes, there is a lot of hand gestures and facial expressions, but not for uh, demonstrating a dowry theme. So when you are confronted with such an issue, how do you approach the choreography then? Okay, one is talking, because you're talking of dowry, I'd like to go back to what is for me one of Amma's most seminal pieces, which was created in 1963 when she was learning Gujarati along with my brother and I, and she was reading newspapers and got to read about women throwing themselves into the well, young brides throwing themselves into the well, and two great literary Gujarati people, Umashankar Joshi and Jayanti Dalal, used to be, because they were some of the few people who spoke English fluently, uh, used to be her eyes into understanding Gujarat. And they started talking to her, and later Niranjan Bhagat. 
but these are the people who started talking to her about the social fabric of Saurashtra where dowry was such an important issue. And in 1963, she created this piece called Memory is a Ragged Fragment of Eternity. She didn't want to be bound by language because it's very easy for one language group to say, oh, and therefore dismiss something. Uh, she used shullas, the bowls of Bharatanatyam, uh, as a neutral language. Now you know that shullas are usually spoken beautifully. They are not spoken emotionally. When we do Bharatanatyam or Kuchipuri or Odissi, we do not imbue the shullar with the rasa of the dance piece. Shullas are shullas. Yeah. And you have people who speak them beautifully, sonorously, etc. But Amma actually added emotion directly to the shullas making it a language that anybody could understand because in any language you can hear hatred and you can hear gentleness and you can hear derision and you can hear gossip and i think that was perhaps a seminal breakthrough in the communicability of dance and breaking through using the most classical structure, using the purest, I heard, hate the word pure, but using the purest, most traditional Pandanalur Bharatanatyam. But just by using the shoulders as the language per se, making a major breakthrough in who she could reach. Yes. I have tried to use that as a North Star in some senses. So, for instance, when I'm abroad primarily and I'm often invited to high schools or to completely non-dance audiences to give lecture demonstrations and I can see that the audience is not interested about my talking about a thousand years of India's history or whatever. So I usually invite somebody from the audience to come and tell me a story, their story. And I have had stories from Goldilocks to Superman to Spider-Man to the Hulk and in Africa to Anansi. And I make up mudras. But I make up mudras within, like, you know, the Oxford English Dictionary brings in new words every year. Yeah. It's still within the context of the dictionary. So, for instance, if I do this for a phone, it is very easily understood. And it is within the same mudra series. I am just using it differently. Or if, I, if I'm showing something like this and instead I do this, you know I'm talking about a computer. So even within the hasta mudras, there is an incredible uh, possibility of taking it further in the truth of the alphabet. I have, in my own language, very often dissociated the fullness of Bharatanatyam by using maybe just an arm and changing it, or maybe just using the feet but doing something very different with my hands, or not doing anything with my hands, or perhaps using my hands like this but still doing diditai or diditai, not using any of the arms, to fragment it and to attach that fragment to something else. Now, I have found Bharatanatyam, and I find it increasingly as I get older, the most sophisticated and rich language to bounce off. I don't do it with Kuchipuri. I've never been able to do it with Kuchipuri. And though it's a style I love, I have found that I find difficulty in making Kuchipuri a language that I can talk contemporary stuff with. Bharatanatyam is different. Besides that, over the last few years, I've been writing my own Padams and Varanams and so on about contemporary issues, about, about finding my place in the world, about my relationship with spirituality and with God, in my case, goddess. Uh, but things like that, about 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 the fact that I have a daughter who is gay. 
about honor killings. And I have found that they find a lot of echo with classical audiences. Because I am following the exact grammar of Pallavi, Anu Pallavi, Charanam and so on. Gotcha. I'm putting all the correct jatis in between. But only the subject matter has changed. It is still done in pure Carnatic. And my question to those who question me is that if the Natya Shastra says, here is a language, use it for what you want to say, why have we stopped it 200 years ago? Yeah. Perhaps when it was created, the quest for the self, the quest for spirituality were the most important issues. And perhaps, or I'm pretty sure, that if those gurus were alive today, they would have found other things that need discussing much more yes, than the need for whether Krishna will come and embrace me. Yeah. Or if Krishna does come and embrace me, I'm going to say, Krishna, embrace me. But if your embrace with me is right, why is somebody's embrace with somebody else wrong just because they are born of different castes? Yes, absolutely. So it is within the purview of my love for Krishna that I'm asking these questions. But it's still in the absolute tradition of the Pandanalu style of Bharatanatya. Yeah. Uh, and uh, okay, you have explained very beautifully how you use the vocabulary of Bharatanatyam, a very classical art, to address several contemporary issues. But since you uh, just uh, mentioned uh, Padams, Varnams, the Javalis also, they have a highly erotic and uh, Shringar Purnam, you know, full of love and longing. Um, so their, their feeling is of that. Now, when you address, uh, like you mentioned, an issue of an or honor killing, do you think while doing so, the Shringar uh, aspect, the Anga, which is so crucial to a classical art form, is lost? Is uh, Also, is Shringar important when we talk about classical arts? I think Shringar is what you are talking about when you talk of hatred. Because what is hatred without love? What is hatred without love? These are the two pole opposites, aren't they? So you're not referring to Shingara in the person, but you are saying that a stasis has to be a stasis of Shingara and love and compassion. And the questioning is why are we going away from it? But the reference is still to this. I don't think showing Shingara is always important. I think the language is too important to reduce it to only talking of Shringara. I think it's like saying, should all English be only the sonnets of X, Y, or Z? Or should we only talk of the daffodil? No, I think the language is being reduced. Love is a very important part of life. So is compassion, so is joy. And one is questioning why some people are not allowed it, why some love is wrong. In showing that wrongness, I'm still showing Shringara. So yes, I'm showing Shringara in hatred, but no, I don't think Shringara is the only thing that is important for our dancing. And you know, a lot of people have asked me that as a feminist, how is it that I do all these poems of saying, oh, I long for you, I sit at your feet, don't throw me away, etc. I don't. I don't. I have a problem with those. So I will do the Khandita, but I won't necessarily do the Abhisarika. I used to before my consciousness was completely awake. So even within my Margam, I have found pieces within the classical Margam of 200 to 2000 years ago, which are questioning. It's just that people don't do them. They are there. There are Varnams which say, don't think you can just chuck me just because you've changed your mind. Or there are, uh, there are amazing Nandas, Nanda, Ninda Stutis, uh, which are very tongue-in-cheek in what they say about the Lord by saying everything that she's not supposed to say. So there are Javalis. There are, there are all manner of things if one needs to look for them. Yeah, but I'm sure, uh, Malikaji, that when you... I mean, of course, Amrinani Ji paved a way uh, especially in the state of Gujarat, for the reception of these 
contemporary theme productions. But I'm sure uh, the awareness of uh, uh, to classical arts is still so low that I want to know when you do uh, your current current productions, how are they received, and uh, what is your take away from the reception that uh, you get? Okay. I'm going to stop a second. They're changing the battery. Two other innovations that Amma brought in very early to introduce the North to Bharatanatyam or Bharatanatyam to the North was that very early, 1949, she did an entire Kathakali piece in Gujarati so that people knew the poem very well. They knew the songs very well. And so they immediately related to it because once you know, for instance, that this is king three times, you have seen it, then even if it's in another language, you know it's king. So in Darpana, from the first Arangetrams, she started having at least one Padam in the mother tongue of the person who was doing it. That's one thing. And the second is that she had other students come on stage and explain each piece. One of them would speak Tamil, which was not her language. And the other one would repeat it exactly in Gujarati or Hindi or Bengali or whatever it was. And this has led to a huge opening up in what they do. We've had the students who have done Vola Re as one of their Padams. And we've had lots of Tagore, of course. But uh, we've had people doing it in Spanish and in English and, you know, depending on what their mother tongue is. And this somehow, I find that with audiences, once you give them a key, they have it. Because then this feeling of alienation immediately goes away. So even in a normal performance, if I introduce my own piece saying, Krishna, why don't you come? Go away. I'm angry with you. And then do the piece. Then very early on, you can see, ah, that's what she's doing. Oh, that's what she's saying. And then you break that otherwise inscrutable distance that people put up. And I think there are devices like this that, that you need to bring in. About my contemporary work, uh, when I came back from the Mahabharata, a lot of my erstwhile um, contemporaries said, uh, doing this kind of work like Shakti is going to be suicide for you. You're doing so amazingly as a Bharatanatyam Kuchipuri dancer, just stick to that. And I felt that I couldn't stick to that. And now 30 years later, I think um, the demand for my contemporary work is the same or higher than the demand for my classical work. One of the reasons why I've been able to get away with the lot that I do is because I can still do a full margam in Pakka Pandan Nallur style even today. And I think that anybody saying, oh, she's taking a shortcut, she can't do Bharatanatyam anymore, can't say that because of that. And I take great pride in it. You know, I fall in love with Bharatanatyam more every day. There was a period when I used to feel stale. And then I would do it because I was doing it. But for the last 10 years, you know, I just stretch out my hand and the sheer ergonomic beauty of that hand thrills me. And for me today to go back to doing adavus perfectly or, or teaching the kids here, I don't teach, but again, like Amma, I supervise the classes. It's a joy. And for, to be able to sit in a perfect aramandi is a joy from a completely different kind. But it is something I fall in love with more. Yeah. And uh, Malikaji, there are a lot of questions which I wish to ask you, but there's limited time between us. So there's one uh, very interesting question which I want to end this interview with is that you are a dancer, a choreographer, an administrator, a publisher, and even um, you know a politician. So <laughs> which is the role that you enjoy the most and uh, you reflect and connect with the most? Which of your eyes do you prefer, the right or the left? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who says one has to choose? I think I'm a better human being and I'm more passionate about each of these things because I do several things. I think if somebody locked me up in a house and said only dance, I would be lesser of a dancer. If somebody had said to me, be only a mother or be only a publisher, I would have been a lesser person. I think there is a certain, I suppose it's a character thing that 
I like to live under that kind of pressure. And over the years, there have been intense periods. But I have always, because I'm primarily self-employed or not employed, just self, I have been able to juggle so that when there's a crisis in one, I have been able to give more time to that. And when there's, so for instance, you said political thing. When I was fighting my election for that one month, there was nothing else. From 6 a.m. to midnight, there was only that. But I'm able to do it, and I've been very fortunate. But don't ask me to choose. It's not a valid question. But uh, nonetheless, Malika ji, this was a very, uh, <laughs> it was a very learning experience speaking with you, especially for young artists and you know the public at large who are reeling under these uncertain times. And uh, I hope they are able to take some value away from this talk of determination and of pursuit of excellence, you know, which all the series was about. So thank you so much for giving us your thank time. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for your patience. <laughs> thank you, Malikaji. Thank you.